Hello? Hello. Is that loud? Hi guys. Hello everyone. Can you can you hear me? Okay. Um, I just want to thank all of you and welcome you to Fresh Cups Open Mic Poetry Night. Um, we're trying to do it the third Wednesday of every month. If you guys are interested in more information about that, just go onto our Facebook page or afterwards come up and ask me personally. Um, my name is Allison, by the way, for those of you who don't know me, because um, I see a couple new faces here, which I'm excited about. Um, so we're going to get started. If anybody hasn't signed up who wants to participate, come let me know. Um, we're going to give each poet about five to six minutes to share. And I just ask that we are going to try to hold all the applause until they're done speaking, just because it can be a little awkward when you're up here and you don't know when to start and stop. But OK. Um, and with that, I'm going to start off sharing something I wrote. OK. Um, so a little bit of backstory about this. I, I recently come, came in contact with somebody um, who was just not a very nice person. Uh, but when you first meet somebody, you're not really sure what their true intentions are. Uh, but I quickly learned that this was not a nice person to hang out with. So this is called Foul. I do not pity the man who lashes out to assert dominance. I do not pity the man who grasps for control through barbed wire words. And I do not pity the man who claims to pity me, but I pity the boy who he grew up to be, illuminating his life with a gaslight, setting fire to everything you touch, but you won't touch me, not again. All right. This is untitled. Right. Picking panties, oh, hello. fails us sometimes. Okay. Picking pantyhose out of bloody knees, sloppy ankles heaving hit the pavement, bruised ego eclipsed by the shiny bottom of another beer can. Six silver tongue suitors line up to taste the bitter juices of a bruised peach. Mm. Right. I have one more to share. Sweet is the bitter of the salt of my tears welling at the brim of sunken eyelided shores, time unmoving while simultaneously ushering in the tides of dawns, one after another until what was present is now past, is now memory, is now gone. And that's all I have for you guys. Thank you very much. All right, and then the first poet we had sign up is gonna be Tia. And she's actually our new Poet Laureate of Kids Up County, too. And it's her birthday, so that's pretty cool. Happy birthday! Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, I do want to say, as we, um, as we just started, I'm the first Poet Laureate of Bremerton, so we're working on ideas to build um, poetry community and get readings and have workshops. and. So I have some ideas, and we're kind of moving forward on that. But um, if you have ideas or you have things you'd like to see happen, um, I'd love for you to contact me. And I have some cards. If you want to contact me, I can give you that, them for, for information on how to get a hold of me. OK? There we go. OK. So this first poem is about Bremerton. I taught um, through, OC teaches through at the apprenticeship program at the shipyard. And I taught business English, which was grammar and punctuation, and then uh, business correspondence there, business writing. So this is a poem about coming home after a long day. Navy ships, submarines, and grammar. I leave the building passing cavernous bays and shipyard classrooms, down the long ramp, seven switchbacks from the second floor to the dark hallway leading outside. 
Early morning following a late night, I taught two long classes, resisted by all students. Why, why, why do we have to learn this? I drag my wheeled duffel behind. It tips, acting up as I corner each switchback. A few feet from the door, white feathers scattered beside the walkway, downy small feathers, curled, picked up by the breeze of my passing, bright white, shining in the mechanical darkness, leading me out. I lived in uh, Washington, D.C. for about seven years, and uh, this is after moving back to Seattle from D.C. I drove my truck out and back. Mounds of old food grow behind the seat, along with cans of beer and colas not quite finished. You clean it all out while dressed in a hazard suit, and still it smells. The floorboards undulate. Soap and antiseptic wash away the last bit of scum. But even so, around the edges of clean creeps the taste of rot. You search further to the back where boxes and bags litter the bed under the canopy. Finally, inside a plastic bag, in a paper bag, inside a box, an orange, green and brown and growing slimy. This is Uralee's belt. Even I can find Orion, three stars in a row and one below. The tip of the sword, you can draw an X from the raised arms and the spread feet. His mother, Uralee, was an immortal gorgon, like Medusa, a monster. She tried to kill her son with a scorpion. You will never see Orion in the sky when the scorpion appears. A mythological angry mother, she comforts me with her overreaction and assures me that the violent mother of my childhood is contained in the myth of the Western world. The myth of the always loving and sacrificing mother is recent. Is there a goddess you can show me? I've really come to love ekphrastic poetry, which is poetry about visual art. And um, this um, is a poem that's, it's from a, um, it's commenting on a, a drawing, it's actually a watercolor painting called Heart Singing Like a Tea Kettle. And the title is simply Heart Singing. Silence will not protect you. Warmth will not choke you. Even though you cannot see it, the star shines behind you, and the shadow that you see is yours. The warmth on your neck is a gold chain warmed in your heart, laying across your shoulders, soft comfort against the cool blue, and rising from your singing, steamy heart. And one more. Am I okay on time? a limp microphone here. Yeah. <laughs> and that's a metaphor if I ever heard one. Uh, <laughs> you were talking about um, a, a person that you didn't want to have anything to do with, found out how toxic they were. Well, I had a writing teacher like that actually at a, at a, a three week long workshop. So this is a letter to a former writing teacher. Dear Vonda, you hated me, I knew it. The myth that you did not was like a sky of false stars that led me to a foreign shore when all I wanted was to go home. Your clumsy tongue promised a bright future like a fortune teller who lies to deceive her mark. Fortune teller crimes are not punishable by anyone outside the mirror god that looks back at you. Do you ever think of me 
or allow yourself to acknowledge the bald knot of your deception as an abalone saint covered in pretend pearls. All right, nobody likes a limp mic, so I'm going <laughs> to fix this. non-limp mic. <laughs> so can we say you Prozac the mic? Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you, Tia, for sharing, <coughs> by the way. And thank you, Joe, for helping with the audio and for fixing that mic. Um, and then up next sharing, we're going to have Farrell. First of all, thank you for putting this on and having us so. You're welcome. Thank you for being Okay. Here. I'm going to start out by reading one by William Blake. And you probably know one of his other poems better, Tiger, Tiger, in the Night, Burning Bright. Well, this one, this ain't it. It's called Song. Okay. <clears throat> Fresh from the dewy hill, the merry year, year Smiles on my head and mounts its flaming car Round my young brows the laurel wreaths a shade And rising glories learn around my head My feet are rising, my feet are wings While o'er the dewy lawn I meet my maiden risen from the, like the morn Oh bless those holy feet like angels' feet Oh bless those limbs Bear, <coughs> excuse me, bearing with heavenly light, like an angel glittering in the sky in times of innocence and holy day, joy, to the joyful shepherd's song, his grateful song, to hear the mantle of angels' wings. So when she speaks, the voice of heaven I hear. So when we walk, nothing in, impure comes near. Each field seems Eden, and each calm retreat, each village seems the haunt of holy feet. For the sweet village where the black-eyed maid closes her eyes in sleep beneath night's shade, whenever I enter more than more mortal fire, burn in my soul and does my song inspire. Okay, I'm going to read a few short ones of mine. Put that there. <laughs> okay. This is titled, Dawn of an Open Mind. Upon one entrance into the outer world, early dawn, having an open mind, projects a wisdom of, in, a, in the sunrise when many hues blend, but remain distinct, unique. Another short one, Soul of Compassion. Light, not manufactured by us, fractures the walls of our bias, shatters, grinds pieces of our hate to dust, blown off 
replaced by grace, reaching, teaching, learning, yearning. Light, the soul of compassion, shines a given, a voice by us, radiant, without ration, is light, birthright. Okay. And this is basically two lines. It's just a thought I had, and I call it wisdom present. Brilliant, vibrant, I rise through knowledge sought. Present, I preside righteous through self-thought. I love the ocean, and I wrote two short ones about the ocean, and that probably would take up my five minutes. But okay, the first one's called the invite of pure oceans. The invite of pure oceans takes joy upon our entrance, spreads across mirrored waters, images of life, make, makes re real with our lives, smooth transition through acts of our compassion, given voice, righteous choice. Ocean's light, springs from depths, peace flow, expand from self-thought, become river's might, des destin, ocean's light. Thank you. Thank you, Farrell. Sorry. Um, okay, so our next poet is going to be Noah. Porqué, does everyone know what porqué means? Or what? What? And I wrote a poem about the devil. Hello there, I am the devil. Not much of an entrance, you say. Yet, I am the devil. Notice how terrible and ferocious is my way. You do not believe me. Porqué, porqué. I do not have a heart, much less possess a soul. Then follows reason, I come from that hole below. Still you seem to doubt me, what I claim to be. The devil, the devil, the devil, that's me. Children should run in terror, the world quake in fright. But alas, alack, what an error, when I come into sight. All laugh and call me funny and do not heed my call. The question it seems, now it seems, is whether I am the devil or, or no devil at all. Just because I am short, fat, and not exceedingly handsome, fashion-wise not acceptable, my costume seems to lack some, fate in the, le in the middle, leave me not. I feel suspended, caged, and caught. Here I am between heaven and hell, whether man or devil, not even I can tell. Last chance, one more try on Satan's oath, I must succeed or die. Making no difference, one's rank, race, or creed, evil among us is present to some degree, agreed? Watch your neighbors. Beware of your friends, for some among them display devious trends. Understand evil has its place, sometimes controlling and setting the pace. 
Would you then me the devil offend or cause to lose face? Succeed I will, not fail. You humans are weak, so frail. I am the devil, the devil I will stay. Still you don't believe me, poor K, poor K. <laughs> okay, I got one more short one. I was gonna read, I love clouds, but uh, I got another one here. Plea for femininity, part one. The best of women are hypocrites, cites C.W. Thackeray. Style, not sincerity, is the vital thing, quotes Oscar Wilde. High-powered women are revising, charmingly insincere, but yet beguiling. They return to basic social graces, music, drawing, reading, pretty faces, perfumed bodies, chancelly lace, <coughs> excuse me, languid, dreamy eyes, and tender embraces. Feminine mystique, bespeak of conquest, provoke us with hint of hip, leg, and breast, serve us, seduce us, proffer your best. Ladies, enjoy yourself to our quest. Heed our earnest plea. Femininity. Femininity. Thank you. Thank you, Noah. I just want to say I appreciate all of you for being so respectful and nice. It can be pretty difficult to come up and speak in front of people, so... Y'all are a fantastic crowd. Um, and our next poet is going to be Jennifer. Hello and welcome to the comedy open mic in uh, Fresh Cup. Oh, just kidding. Now we have uh, our uh, DJs actually, MJ, what do you call him? Is, oh, there you are, right there. Thank you very much for setting up sound. I hope that we get a nice little mix out of this. Um, uh, so my name is Jennifer. Um, I'm a, uh, an arts commissioner here in Bremerton. I had the honor of working with our mayor and his wife and the arts commission and our city liaison to uh, get uh, the Poet Laureate program together. And this is uh, a really beautiful culmination of that. I'm excited. My understanding is that this hasn't been as well attended in the past. And um, my instincts tell me that it's a little more well attended now because our city is becoming a little more excited about literary arts. And that's, that's a wonderful thing, it's a good thing. Um, so I have um, written a couple things. I guess it's like a rite of passage that all poets need to put together a, a really horrible chat book in their late 20s, early 30s that no one will ever read or buy and that you have to give away for free even to get people to, to, to have it. I give, I've given about seven of these away in gift baskets at, at auctions. And, um, <laughs> so. Um, I, uh, just quickly, I'll just, I'm, I'm not bragging, but I just got back from Maui and, um, I, I'm like, it left me broke. Like I spent my last 10 bucks here on the bagel and the coffee. Thank you. It was lovely. But, uh, it was my first vacation without kids. That wasn't a conference or a funeral. And so I'm, um, went there and, uh, right before I went, um, I learned about, uh, the death of W.S. Merwin. So poets in the room know who that is. Uh, he lived in Maui um, since the 1970s, um, but he was affiliated with Copper Canyon Press, which is the publishing company nonprofit out in Port Townsend. And they're the ones that first introduced me to W.S. Merwin uh, through this book, which I picked up at some random bookstore. I don't even know where anymore. Um, and so now I always look for the Copper Canyon Press logo when I go to look for poetry books. It's a little Japanese symbol. I don't know what it means, but I look for it. And... Um, so uh, I made a little pil pilgrimage to go find his palm forest, and, the and it's on the, the uh, road to Hana, um, which is kind of infamous for being like a treacherous road when you get through. Um, it, was, it was a lovely drive. I did have some car sickness, um, but uh, it was worth it. Um, I couldn't find it the first time around. I went to the grocery store in Haiku, uh, so go figure, a poet living in the town Haiku. 
Um, and I went to the grocery store. They said, go ask the postman. There's like a little two, two man postman p post office and they told me right where to go. And it's private property, so you're not really supposed to go to this place, but I went anyway, because that's what I do. And I even have a misdemeanor that's no longer on my record from, anyway, never mind. That's another story. <laughs> um, so I went and we traveled down the road and I got to the end and then you see it gets paved. It was dirt and then it was paved and I realized I was in the right place and we got all the way to the end and it's this beautiful, lush space. And what W.S. Merwin did is he moved there in the 70s with his wife and as part of a, of a revitalization effort um, because there's lots of land that was destroyed by the agricultural industry. He and his wife planted palm trees. They brought in palm trees from all over the world. And they did that for, for, for since the 70s. They w woke up, planted palm trees, read, and wrote. And so I just knew that while I was there, which I may never make it again, um, that I had to go and try to find this space. And I wasn't able to get in. I peeked over the, the little fence that was there, and I stayed away from the main path. But I was able to, to at least say that I was there. And there was this giant coconut, like a huge coconut, you know, like sitting nearby. And I was like, I gotta take this. And I took it and, um, you know, they have tarantulas in these coconuts sometimes. I know I'm gonna go way past my time, I'm sorry. But so that was the joke, is like a tarantula's gonna come out and bite you. And I'm like, no. But we made it all the way back and there was no tarantulas. And we husked it the next morning and found out it was rotten. I was so excited because I wanted to taste the sweet coconut milk of my Merwin coconut, but it was rotten. And that just kind of goes to prove that you can't judge a coconut by its cover. So I'm gonna go ahead and read his work. Um, and I'm gonna uh, read one of my poems that was inspired by his work. And I just love the way that he plays with words in this piece and it's just so sweet. It's called Good Night. Sleep softly, my old love, my beauty in the dark. Night is a dream we have, as you know, as you know. Night is a dream you know, an old love in the dark, around you as you go, without end as you know. In the night where you go, sleep softly, my old love, without end in the dark, in the love that you know. Okay, and this one's called A Fallen Moon. It's my own book, I don't even know what pages my stuff's on. All right. Oh, it had the biggest sticky note, whoops. All right, A Fallen Moon, inspired by Good Night by W.S. Merwin. I've fallen fast, my breath is lost, the moon is full of morning frost. The morning moon is full at last, and frosty breath is lost too fast. I've lost you, love, of frost and moon. Last morning's lull has come too soon. Last fallen breath is fast and full. The frosty moon takes morning's lull. And I'm gonna read a couple more for ya. Feng Shui, red cedar serpent, sentient being washed up on the beach, pebbles small, rocks big. An ocean of skipping stones, flat and smooth, thrown back to us to stack and build cities out of. A gift between layers of rock and fog, gray on gray, except for that twisted, washed up, lucky, red cedar serpent, sentient being. This one's called Fixated on the Divine. This one's a little sexy. I think y'all can handle it. <laughs> Fixated on the divine. Cold brass lacquer, green patina dreams. Seeking the divine. Crooked necked elaborated image of a god. A number of divine members have passed through my temple, but so few have authored tithe. They are divine yet still unworthy of shelter and do not stay in my house for long. You are constructing me out of clay, and I let you shape me to be your perfect, moldable princess, a goddess sweet, pure, untainted, glorious. Want to be the image you have crafted, I hold the mask you made for me, I slip clipping hands into silk gloves for you. 
but I fear the darkness you are drawn to in me. Will drown you, but who is lying to who? The ethereal cannot be held on this plane. The divine is not meant to be captured, fixated on me, fixated on you. Tithe and time remain owing. This one is a new one. It's called A Family Curse. And I wrote this one. Um, so I have had a couple of people in my family who've chosen to um, take their life. I have, uh, there's alcoholism, drug addiction, all kinds of addiction in the family. Um, domestic violence, there's a history of uh, sexual abuse, there's all these like gross, you know, like dirty secrets that we don't like to talk about in public. Um, and so this is a little bit about that. The family curse. I have a killer like cancer lying dormant in my DNA. A rude guest who gobbles up all the wine and cheese and pimento loaf sandwiches. A visitor who is violent when drunk smashes all the good china refusing to leave. A squatter who yells for breakfast in the morning, entertains you with charm and bellows in the evening. A manipulator of magnanimous and multi-generational proportions, this infiltrator summons ghosts and flocks of vultures who peck at eyes and carry off members. He must always be watched. I wear a necklace of garlic pearls and a pocket of stones to keep him away, and sometimes they slip through holes and fall into my shoes like marbles. The visitor climbs in through the broken window, slips in drunkenly through the back door, takes up residence, smashing more china and noses. I drink his drafts and chase them with turpentine. Hung over later, looking for my garlic pearls, I shove this unwanted guest out, and he bubbles around the door frame like rancid triple yeast. I fill my pockets with stones to steady myself again into equilibrium. And so it goes, the vicious cycle, circling through family, sometimes simultaneously his bread bakes at our doors, at my uncle's door, at my cousin's door, but they were too far to throw stones at. Their ashes are my stones now. The garlic pearls are from my grandmother, the china, my great-grandmother, the oven door from my mother. Now the ghosts belong to my children. Thank you. Let's give a round of applause again for Jennifer, because I'm going to cry now, but thank you. And our next poet up is going to be Sari. Thank you. Meditating in the dark. Nah, I think I better have the poems in front of me. <laughs> Meditating in the dark, in shadow where water hides from sun, its surface takes the shape of earthly things, evergreens like a many turreted ivied castle wall, red smear of little house on shore, denser dark of the ferry below that reflects nothing of earth, heaven, or water. The nothing is a membrane between worlds where a gull floats, pretending to be a duck far from shore. There are shores whose veils of evergreen I don't want to peek behind. My surfaces are as opaque as water. <coughs> Me and God at the boardwalk arcade. Or rather, I at the adult arcade by the mall, not drinking, lobbing ski balls, ears plugged against the roar of fans cooling bits of Pac-Man and Candy Crush hidden in glossy plastic shells empty of oceans. For moments, I leave all the world but arm and ball, thud and roll, bounce and fall and listen for the clap of your sandals on splintering boards, breathe for the scent of the Atlantic between my blood cells. You're like that now, in me, sea foam floating on the machine roar. Does it offend you that I no longer think you exist? Lend me a quarter and I'll reconsider. <laughs> this last one uh, is inspired by the chapter of The Little Prince where the prince meets a fox who tells him, um, 
one only understands the things that one tames. And uh, the fox also says that right now the wheat fields mean nothing to him, but when uh, the prince has tamed him, he will love the wheat fields because they are golden like the prince's hair. This poem is called Fox Taming. Before we met, the storm had nothing to say to me. Reading the little prince to you in our 11th year, I remember how I'd long to be tamed, to feel the fox's fear, not of men or guns, but of loving the prince who will leave him, to feel the prince's patience as he lay still in the grass, not understanding but granting this gift of sadness. This is how you came to me, slow afternoons sitting nearer and nearer, not touching until smell is enough to reassure us, to ease the tug of distance. If you told me you had another planet to be getting on to, I could have begged you to tame me anyway. When you've left me, I shall love the storm clouds that brood in all the grays of your hair. That one was pretty sexy. I have to say. <laughs> right. Thank you. Um, okay, up next we're going to have Bob. Hi. <coughs> Happy National Poetry Month. <coughs> uh, two of mine and one not. Uh, the title of this one comes from my granddaughter, who is not quite three years old. Remember when all the flowers were animals? On the nature walk, the mosses and tree trunks were different sides of a knowledge. You and I were different sides of a drink not Poured. I saw it swirl in you, its closed vessel. My words to you were a hand on glass. For your daughter, you were as there as dark on day, leveling the bright bearded dandelion heads at each other at arm's length and roaring, meowing, purring, baaing, mooing, cock a doodle dooing. Till just 15 minutes later, she asked us out the gleeful corners of her eyes. Remember when all the flowers were animals? We were a drink we could have shared had the glass or bottle been open. You had her stick to the edges of deep puddles on the nature walk, lest the water get into her boots. But she wanted to splash. She wanted to splash. And when the puddle was a major one, kept being tempted. <coughs> American. He was a man we never met, pinned to the glaring city night like a butterfly on a board, shirtless in hardly spring, and with a tinfoil skirt, untorn, but alive and beautiful as wings. He was a man we never met and spoke to everyone who came within a few feet of his never-pausing shamble, including us, said his spirit was then he thought how to put it, full of hurt. And I have to carry this crap, picking up handfuls of plastic and cloth that lied about being random. He was a man we never met, but came to face us as we waited for a light to change, and I wrenched my sight to see his torso much younger than mine and eyes far older, having looked upon something there was no way to look away from ever. You were as gifted to silence as he to talk, but I recalled how when first off the locked ward, you longed to run into someone you'd known there, someone like this. But he was a man we never met. He asked me, almost fearful of the reply, what nationality do you think I am? What, American, I said? But that was the last thing he'd expected anyone to say, and his tongue crumbled for the first time. Before he could get out the speech he rehearsed about how his true homeland was heaven where he lived with Jesus Christ, we were halfway across the street 
the man behind us for the rest of our lives. It was still my guess, American. I'm going to read a poem by James Wright, who is almost my favorite poet, right behind Sari. <coughs> a Blessing. Just off the highway to Rochester, Minnesota, twilight bounds softly forth on the grass, and the eyes of those two Indian ponies darken with kindness. They have come gladly out of the willows to welcome my friend and me. We step over the barbed wire into the pasture where they have been grazing all day alone. They ripple tensely. They can hardly contain their happiness that we have come. They bow shyly as wet swans. They love each other. There is no loneliness like theirs. At home once more, they begin munching the young tufts of spring in the darkness. I would like to hold the slenderer one in my arms, for she has walked over to me and nuzzled my left hand. She is black and white, her mane falls wild on her forehead, and the light breeze moves me to caress her long ear that is delicate as the skin over a girl's wrist. Suddenly I realize that if I stepped out of my body, I would break into blossom. Thanks. Bad. Feeling a lot of sexual tension in this room right now, but okay. um, my mind's elsewhere because I forgot who was up next. <laughs> okay. Thank you. And our next poet is going to be Ian. Short person here. Good. All right. I haven't tried reading this one in a while. We'll see how it goes. No second Troy. Why should I blame her that she filled my days with misery or that she would of late have taught to ignorant men most violent ways or hurled the little streets upon the great had they but courage equal to desire? What could have made her peaceful with a mind that nobleness made simple as a fire with beauty like a tightened bow, a kind that is not natural in an age like this, being high and solitary and most stern. Why, what could she have done being what she is? Was there another Troy for her to burn? I did not write that, I wish I had. That was by William Butler Yeats. Um, I did write this one and I don't have it written down. This high risk of embarrassment here. Um, it's called 85 Days. The sun is still, regrettably, the sun. It still burns my skin, warms the morning air, dries the grass wet with rain. It still sets and rises. It still burns. 85 sunsets later, I'm still missing the light of your smile. 85 nights since your head blew open, my tears won't fall as naturally as the rain. And 85 sunrises after your dreams bled across cobblestones, the sun is still in spite of you, the sun. The best thing is if I missed a line, no one but me will know. <laughs> This is by uh, Peter Virek. It's called To Helen of Troy, New York. I sit here with the wind is in my hair. I huddle like the sun is in my eyes. I am, I wish you'd contact me, alone. A fat lot, you'd wear crepe if I was dead. It figures who I heard there when I phoned you. It figures when I came there who was went. Dogs laugh at me. Folks bark at me since then. She is, they say, no better than she ought to. I love you irregardless how they talk. You should have done it, which it is no crime. With me, you should have done it what they say. I sit here with the wind is in my hair. 
it's not supposed to make any sense, so. <laughs> and I did write this last one long, long ago. It's called the Brandenburg Concerto Number no. 2, and it's mostly a true story. Walking over the Aurora Bridge, over the canal, the gas works, and Fremont's history, Bach echoing through my ears, I lean from the concrete and steel span. The secret of flight is in the music, a chance to soar with the gulls crying over Lake Union's oil waves. The notes, the melody, the rises, the dips, and the sweet flute sweep the air as gulls wings. I can almost grasp the secret. It comes closer the farther I lean. Thank you. Our next poet is going to be Gordon. I played a lot of basketball when I was a kid, loved the game, and eventually by dint of thousands of hours I became sort of okay uh, given my complete lack of natural ability. And uh, this poem was about uh, the last time I played any kind of semi-organized basketball about 15 years ago. It's called Move Your Feet on D, Old Man. The tower still stood the last time you shot hoops, but here's a bent orange rim, a ball, and six guys. You're stuck guarding this agile young giant. Your opponent's got four inches on you? Not a problem if you're quicker, if you're quicker stronger, and peak testosterone invulnerable. Being 45, you're none of those things. Play the kid tight, one fake, and he smokes you for layups. Retreat two steps and watch him nail jumpers you might have blocked back to when you still had springs. You admire his solid form, shoulders square to the basket, straight elbow, <laughs> wrist flick, high arc, practiced follow through. While waving hum comically at lacy passes, you slow motion sweat and stumble. He beats you like you beat your father once, when dad was, shit, the same age you are now. Half a head shorter, softened belly, post-prime reflexes that gave him no chance to release unblocked shots. While you could juke, elevate, light him up at will from 20, or butt push him to unmissable two-footers. You can't recall 1980 details, but after seeing his antique canvas high tops resting on a stack of old bank calendars he left beside the curb for the trash man, you hope you cut your dad some slack. I retired uh, from the military. I did 31 years uh, in the Army as a musician. And uh, so I am a veteran. Uh, and this is a, a poem I wrote called uh, Uncle Sam's Alumni L Newsletter. Yeah. Dear valued retiree, just because you're out, that doesn't mean you're out of our hearts. When you join our US military family, you're always family. We hope you'll visit the VFW or American Legion. We hope you'll march patriotic parades, accept with pride your nation's lasting gratitude. Great veterans like you don't forget their history. Duty endures when a uniform is hung in a peacetime closet's final display. Ironed, medals shined, dress right dress. You're pushing 60 now, right? Of course, right, we keep your files forever. All 10 fingerprints, x-rays of teeth and knees, we collected DNA when you jacked off on your commander's desk in February 1994. <laughs> Naughty soldier. We hear that you've been sad, and your sadness makes us sad. Did you know that treatment costs for PTSD are crippling your VA? That's the saddest news of all. But you're asking, how do I fit in? Your records show you only suffering from flight or fight response to sudden noises, plus depression, which runs chronic in your family, let's be honest. It doesn't seem quite fair, we're certain you agree, to clutter up the system with such minor league complaints. Where's the solution? What's the solution? Who's the solution? We're so happy that you ask. You're a Duke Wayne, Audie Murphy, hero archetype who demands the bottom line up front. The numbers are the numbers, and we require 22 military suicides per day. We know, you know what's kept in that metal box behind those desert boots. 
If not now, then when? Uh, I'm going to give you one more poem. Um, let's see. That's a fun one. Empty bucket list. I heard a voice I never saw. It said, you've only got six months, so live. While walking on a trash-strewn beach, regretting all those squandered years, I built an urgent mental spreadsheet. I liquidated all my wealth, applied for 27 credit cards, began to eat dessert for breakfast, smoked a ton of dope, stole a car, tried like hell to keep myself from jail, which worked except that weekend in Key West. 180 times I watched the sun go down and up. I thought enlightenment might come, but no, it's just the sun. I climbed a mountain. Stupid clouds obscured my view of beauty someone told me I might find. I sought a man I'd wronged and wronged him more. I meant to say goodbye to those I loved, but time drug on. I shrugged, tore out my list, and then, I hate to say, I didn't die. <laughs> Thank you, Gordon. Gave me a lot to think about just now. Um, all right, our next poet is going to be Caleb. Let's give him a warm welcome to him. Uh, this is my first time ever doing this. You're going to rock it. <laughs> uh, my poem is about a heart's desires. Heart's desires. So many unsensible things, so much uncertainty, so much hurt, yet at the end of each stroke, it all came down to love. At the end of it all, it's the most beautiful piece created with love. Love was the last thing that gave it meaning. True love could never die because it feels incomplete, yet fulfilled, unwavering, yet lonely, but bright, strong, and patient, it moves without haste or thought, yet every move it makes is inviting, truly meaningful, and truly giving fully to the one receiving. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. For your first time, Caleb, you did a really great job, so thank you. We appreciate you. Um, and then I think we're almost done. We got one more poet who signed up, and it's going to be Joe. Thank you very much, everybody. Let's give it up for Allison for hosting this, everybody. Thank you so much. All right, uh, this first one I wrote in 2012, it's called Don't Text Me. Call me what you will, a pill, a chill, a temporary thrill. Call me what you feel ideal. Call me when the time is right, in night, in fright, in sudden flight. Call me when the lights ignite. Call me when the autumn leaves fall and the sound of rain reminds you of us. Call me so we can stargaze and warm our souls with thoughts alone. Call me so we can climb a tree and share all of Earth's energies. Call me so we can pretend we're kids again and dance in the prairies of imagination land. Call me when you're sad. I promise I won't be mad. In fact, call me when you're bad. I'll tell you that's rad. You can even call me at 2 AM. It's OK to tell me everything they said, because come morning, I will cure your head with the best breakfast in bed. This one is called What I Do Know. I may not be able to tell you why you are here, and I may not be able to tell you if there is a heaven. But what I do know is, there is no parallel to the beauty and love you shine upon this universe. I may not be able to tell you why you feel the way you do, and I may not be able to tell you why I feel the way I do, but what I do know is, my once wild eye has become fixated on the essence of your existence. I may not be able to tell you why planets collide, and I may not be able to tell you why stars die, but what I do know is, you have created a gravitational pull that tugs at this meteor I call my heart. I may not be able to tell you what the future holds, and I may not be able to tell you if the past is relevant, but what I do know is, all of time stands still when you let me feast upon the passion you possess for me. Uh, this one's called Universal Language. 
Planets colliding, stars dying, dark matter rising. And yet the universe whispers softly. She tells me that you're the one worth fighting for. No longer convinced of coinciding coincidences, they remind me that only minutes may remain to once again capture the fruits of your flesh. When I see you, my pulsating heart races towards you, creating a polarization that attracts the light you shine. Your vibrant eyes, your luscious lips, your pervasive passions, tugging me towards you as if you are the moon and I am the submissive sea. Our dance shall resemble that of a planet's holistic orbit around her sun. When close, we feel the heat from the fire within. When far, we feel the entropies of the emptiness between us. I'll hold you the same way gravity holds the universe and love you the same way stars love to shine. Um, this one's dedicated to my grandmother. She passed away uh, just over 10 years ago. She loved writing poetry, and uh, unfortunately, she passed before I got into poetry myself, but I do remember growing up her having an influence on me. And so her influence led me to take a poetry class at OC. Uh, and when I did, it opened my world to poetry and gave me an appreciation for it that I wish that I could have had when she was alive, but I understand that that's how life works sometimes. So <laughs> it's okay. This one's called For You. I listened to the ocean today. It reminded me of you. Everything reminds me of you. Wind, land, love. It all reminds me of a life once cherished. Ah, yes, the days of glory, when to believe is to become and to become is to behold. You were always the one who cared, the heart, the proud, the pure. You were always the one who would sacrifice it all. Fragments of a broken dream are the only means of seeing you now. Nothing is the same without you here. The family, the holidays, the humility. Nothing is the same without your beautiful soul. But a conversation as fragile as the sea is now what defines me. And I will always carry the light you shine, the bright, the bold, the beautiful, just like you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> All right, so I got, I got one more. Um, this one's actually not a poem. It's uh, one of my favorite comedians um, who passed away from pancreatic cancer. And he was one of the uh, best. And he was more of the, one of the most profound in his time. And towards the end of his career, uh, this is something he said at the end of his uh, stand-up routine. He says, uh, the world is like a ride in an amusement park. And when you choose to go on it, you think it's real because that's how powerful our minds are. The ride goes up and down and around and around. It has thrills, chills, and it's very brightly colored, and it's very loud, and it's fun for a while. Many people have been on this ride a long time, and they begin to wonder, hey, is this real, or is this just a ride? And another people have remembered, and they come back to us and they say, hey, don't worry, don't be afraid, ever, because this is just a ride. And you know what we do? Well, we kill those people. <laughs> Shut him up. I've got a lot of money invested in this ride. Shut him up. Look at my furrows of worry. Look at my big bank account and my family. This has to be real. It's just a ride. But we always kill the good guys who try to tell us that. You ever notice that? And let the demons run amok. But it doesn't matter because it's just a ride. And we can change it at any time we want. It's only a choice. No effort, no work, no job, no savings of money. Just a simple choice right now between fear and love. The eyes of fear want you to put bigger locks on your doors, buy guns, close yourself off. The eyes of love instead see us all as one. Here's what we can do to change the world right now, to a better ride. Take all that money we spend on weapons and defenses each year and instead spend it feeding and clothing and educating the poor of the world, which it would pay for many times over, not one human being excluded, and we can explore space together, both inner and outer, forever in peace. Bill Hicks, 1993. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Made me want to call my grandma, by the way. We should all love our grandparents, right? Um, and then we actually do have one more person who wanted to read, and that's going to be Allison. Uh, I have been working since two, uh, winter of 2002, 2003 on a book about my late uh, uh, my late mother and my experience being raised by a mentally ill and charismatic mother and somewhere in the process this also began to be 
a fantastical story of two little naked savages making their way to the sea, who are my mother and myself in some alternate universe. And I finished a first draft of the book um, a week ago. And I was looking for something to read. Uh, excerpts from that don't go well into five minutes. And I picked up a, a journal from one of my writing retreats um, about two, two and a half years ago. And I would write, I would work on the book throughout, throughout the day. Excuse me, my, I've had a lot of coughs, my throat's a mess. Um, at, in the morning when I first got up, in the evening when I was winding down, I would just write randomly in my journal. So I'm going to read some even more random than the way they are in the journal, uh, just excerpts. Last night I dreamed of crows and raccoons, the clever scavengers, that's me. I'm watching birds diving into the lake. They paddle across the mirror silver surface, trailing their little ruffled wakes behind them. And then they upend themselves and vanish, leaving only concentric ripples until they come up someplace else. There shall be a small lake in my book. Uh, I am drinking Cafe Coretto. I brought some decaf coffee with me and some sugar and a little bit of grappa distilled by a friend of ours on Vashon. And the, the licorice flavor of the coffee suddenly reminds me of a Middle Eastern cafe in Greenwich Village where I went with my college friend. It was a haunt of handsome and often very stupid Middle Eastern men. Kathy went there to pick them up. The more beautiful and the more stupid, the better. She was in love with her father, and she knew it. And she said that the idea of making love with a man as intelligent as her stooped, nearsighted, brilliant father felt like incest to her. So she cho chose men who were young, dark, dark-haired, dark-eyed, dark-skinned, beautiful, and as I said, stupid. Everything her father was not. I'll go read in a little while, but this drink required me to sit at the table as at a cafe table and stare out at the moon. That's enough. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to let all of you know that I appreciate you for coming out tonight. Um, you all are wonderful, and I just enjoy that we can provide a space for people to come and be vulnerable for a little while. Um, all of you are very beautiful, so thank you. Um, also, our next poetry reading is going to be, let me pull up my calendar. It is going to be the 15th of May. It's going to start at the same time, 6.30, so I hope to see all of you there. And as a closure to this evening, since it's Tia's birthday, Jennifer's going to start off with happy birthday. All right, you guys. I just love this microphone so much I want to get back up here. No, congratulations, Tia, on this prestigious new role you have, um, a poet laureate. And we're going to sing her happy birthday because it's her birthday today, okay? But I'm really not a very good singer, so... Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. <coughs> Happy birthday, dear Tia. Happy birthday.